Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to Her Journey to Self podcast. My name is Tamara and I am your host. Today, we are sitting down with an amazing woman. She's an artist and a fitness professional, Yasmin Venable. Hey, girl. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, Yasmin and I used to work together at a fitness studio in New York, Shay's Fitness, pre-pandemic. It's so crazy because January, I worked through the last week of January, and then I went on maternity leave. Um, Two weeks later, I had my daughter, and then like two and a half weeks later, we were in a pandemic. So (laughs) life has like completely shifted you know I was thinking like oh hey I'll see you guys you know in a few months maybe at the end of the summer nope that that never happened (laughs) so how have you been throughout these past what like 20 months 21 months no it's it's been a crazy journey um it was abrupt you know when we were all working we were doing 10 million things all the time. And then out of nowhere, we were doing nothing. Um, so it's it's been a large transition uh, for, for me. Do you want me to go like deeper into that or? Well, yeah, let's talk about that pivot because specifically, well, first let everybody know. I mean, I know you, but <laughs> let everybody know like what you do. Cause you're an artist, you know, you're a performing artist, but you're also a fitness professional. So just let everybody know um, what you do and who you are. Yes. Um, so as Tamara's wonderfully introduced me, I am Yasmin Venable. Uh, I'm a dancer uh, and choreographer from Harlem NYC. Um, mainly a Pilates instructor and I do mainly contemporary and modern dance, but I do a little bit of everything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So the word pivot um, was pretty popular in 2020, you know, when the pandemic first started, because a lot of people had to learn how to pivot. And I remember early on in March, um, when everything started to shut down, um, my heart was really heavy for artists, you know, of course, as an artist, but I feel like sometimes artists always get the short end of the stick, <laughs> you know, and I think the world really started to acknowledge the importance that artists play in society and the world as a whole. Um, But it was really difficult for us. I mean, I was planning on, you know, being out of commission (laughs) for a little bit because I had just given birth. Um, But for everybody else, it was like a complete shock. You know, theaters shut. I know one friend, like they, their show had just opened. They performed one weekend and then it was like, oh, okay, everybody go home, (laughs) you know, so... (laughs) What has that been like for you to pivot during this time? You know, have you been working in these last few months, you know, on your artistry? Um, I know you've been active with fitness, but as far as being an artist, what has this time looked like for you? So it's been a major pivot. Uh, I've actually started choreographing more um, and doing more of my own work and exploring who I am as an artist, which has been really nice because um, I'm not I'm not saying that I don't love dancing for other people and being a part of large productions and things like that. Um, but it's been nice to explore who I am as a dancer, my individual voice, which has been really great. Um, so that's been a big major pivot for me as still being a dance artist, but turning on uh, my own creative choreographic juices, which has been fun. Yeah. What? So what does that journey feel like? You know, because sometimes in life, I think we can get stuck on this one path and sometimes we can go outside of our comfort zone, you know? So what is this transition, this pivot? What has that felt like for you? Has it been enjoyable? Has, you know, there been a little bit of resistance or a little bit of fear? There's definitely been some fear, uh, for sure, uh, just in terms of just having confidence, being confident in that, okay, I 
can choreograph and I enjoy my work and that my voice is valuable as much as anyone else's voice. Um, so it's a little bit of breaking out of that shell of being like, okay, I don't, I tell other people's stories to now like telling my own story. Um, so there was a lot of fear and um, like, oh, people aren't gonna like my stuff or it's not gonna be good or, <laughs> uh, so there was a lot of overcoming of fear that had to happen um, and just being vulnerable and allowing myself to go through that process. Yeah, how do you think we can work through that? I mean, because I completely relate to, you know, those feelings of insignificance and, you know, worrying that nobody is going to listen or watch or enjoy. I mean, even with this podcast, like literally, <laughs> like still to this day, especially since season three, this is the first time having guests on, you know, the first two seasons, it was just like me pouring my heart out. <laughs> um, but, you know, there is still that fear, even with reaching out to ask people, you know, to be on the podcast. It's like, Oh, nobody's going to want to come, <laughs> you know? So what are some tangible things that you do to really combat those negative thoughts and feelings? A lot of time it's a meditation and self-reflection and taking time to maybe even write or, yeah, like I love to write about it and just say like, what are my insecurities and what are the things that are holding me back from wanting to do what I need to do? And then what are the positive outcomes that can come from doing what I need and want to do? And with that process, I kind of filter that a lot of times the strengths over way out the things that are keeping me from doing what I need to do. Uh, so I, Part of it is kind of, I don't want to say mentally tricking myself. <laughs> I just started rewatching uh, Star Wars, um, the whole saga from the beginning. So it's been great rewatching it. And with that, you know, they talk about the force. And a lot of it uh, is, you know, working with your own force and uh, kind of telling yourself, like, okay, I know you feel this anxiety, this fear, this, uh, you know, insecurity and just telling yourself okay yes that's like in the back seat i'm just gonna go for it and drive forward and do what my heart is telling me that i should do yeah yeah and yeah i don't think it's like tricking your mind i think it's like working a muscle you know because when you're working out when you're trying to you know grow your muscles it's something that you have to be intentional about you know, if you want to improve your biceps or your triceps, you have to make sure you're picking up those weights a few times um, a week and increasing the weight, you know, so it's it's an intentional practice because if we just sit and say, OK, I want X, Y and Z to happen as far as, you know, shifting my mindset, we can say that. But if we aren't implementing practices that is going to help us actually shift that mindset nothing is going to happen you know I think sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking that we are doing something when we actually aren't um, something else that I thought about while you were speaking is just the resistance to the overall process this is something that I struggle with especially when it comes to journaling. I've been writing since, I don't even know, I was a little girl. I've you know always had diaries. I have journals on top of journals on top of journals. But in the past few years, there has been a lot of resistance to journaling. And I think some of that comes from just like past disappointment and not really having that belief anymore that what I'm doing is beneficial to me. So do you ever experience resistance when it comes to those different mechanisms that you have in place, such as journaling? Yes, all the time. Um, all the time, I there's that little voice of like, eh, you'll do that later. Or, eh, it's not really that important. Or, eh, you should be doing this instead. Or, um, 
I do feel that resistance sometimes. Um, and there's this really great book. Um, I'm so bad. I don't remember the author of the book, but it's the art or the the art of, no, I'm sorry, The War of Art. There we go. The War of Art is the title. And the first chapter of the book talks about that resistance that you feel. And usually the more resistant, the more procrastination, the more you kind of tell yourself like, no, 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 like I'll get to that later, are usually the things that are the most valuable for us as artists. It's the thing that you should be putting your time and energy in. Um, so the way I fight that resistance is, I mean, <laughs> I'm almost like a child in a sense where I'm like, okay, if you do this, then, you know, we get to have this treat or we get to do something that you like afterwards. You know, it's like, okay, I do this. I deserve to eat a cookie at lunch or <laughs> something like that. So I, I give myself little treats for accomplishing those things that I find a little hard to accomplish, even though I know I need to be doing these things. Yeah. And I think we're all children at heart anyway, you know, so we have adult tantrums um, all the time. (laughs) So, yeah. So, you know, the reward system definitely does work. And I've heard so many people reference that book, the, the art of war or the war of art, which one is it? The war of art the war of art so i'm just going to take this as a little nudge that i need to you know pick it up and finally read it because it's been a few years i've heard people reference that book you know as an artist i value wellness and my perspective of wellness is mind body and spirit so i practice a wholeness in my life and I really started to fall in love with fitness and wellness in I want to say undergrad when was that time where you realized that this was going to be a path that you were going to take for me it was right after uh undergrad right after college is when I realized um that I really loved fitness I like most college students uh, was quite broke and (laughs) still was dancing and um, couldn't really afford a gym membership, couldn't really afford to take those Pilates, bar, stretch, all those classes on top of my dance classes and other things that, you know, I was already struggling to financially support. Uh, So I was like, "Hmm, you know what, let me learn how to actually teach myself. And from that, I started teaching others as part of my Pilates certification. And then I really fell in love with teaching other people and seeing the joy that they have when they, you know, finally figure out to use that muscle that they have never used before, or, you know, they're happy that they're seeing their shape turn into a shape that they are, you know, find more pleasing with themselves as, or even small goals as if, they, you know, they made it up the stairs or down the stairs today without any pain, like things like that, like make my day. Uh, so that's when I really started to find that I loved fitness and wellness and just saw the, I guess, the duality of it with artistry. Yeah. And I think it's such a beautiful marriage. Like, I feel like it made complete sense that I fell in love with fitness and I started working as a fitness instructor while still being an artist, you know, going on auditions and performing because especially with the perspective of mind, body and spirit, as an artist, you have to be mentally and physically and even spiritually fit to perform and to take on these different roles and different characters. And of course, when you're working in the fitness industry, you yourself, because you are the vessel, you know, to create change in your community and your household, um, as far as health and wellness. So you must be mentally and physically and, you know, spiritually fit as well. So I think that there is just this beautiful marriage between the two. As far as in your personal life, how do you see that marriage play out as an artist and a fitness professional? Hmm. Personally, my, I would say my athleticism has changed, 
how I view art. Um, not saying that I didn't do a lot of pedestrian things prior in my art, but I have have a new appreciation for them um, in my art, seeing that, okay, walking or small, just hand gestures and things like that are really great movements um, as well, or understanding the, the flow and the energy that is released when you do certain motions. And sometimes that's just enough. It doesn't have to be, you know, a whole elaborate thing where it's just like me just doing this. I'm like, that's doing it. <laughs> um, so for me personally, it's, it's changed how I view dance, that it doesn't have to be everything so pretty and everything, um, you know, is aesthetically pleasing. A lot of times in fitness, especially for me personally, <laughs> it's like those last two, three sets, you're fighting, you're pushing, you're, you're, you're working hard. This is not easy. It's not pretty. It's um, kind of grit work a little bit in a sense. Um, so that has changed me as an artist. Um, but also just knowing that there's that balance um, that a lot of times art is cathartic in a way and it's a release and it's good for our health and our overall wellness just as you know we work our muscles and things like that um which is also beneficial for our overall wellness so they go hand in hand in that sense and that they're both important for your overall balance and wellness um fitness and artistry and doesn't that just mirror life in general as far as you know the the hard work <laughs> and the struggle that you have to put in. I'm just thinking about even this morning when I was on my Peloton and um my dad is sitting in the front watching the news. <laughs> and I'm always like, especially when it gets to like towards the end and you're like dying. I'm trying to not make like ugly faces <laughs> and breathe all hard because I'm like, oh my gosh, when is this workout going to be over? And that mirrors life a lot, especially when, you know, we're going through something or, you know, we're pivoting and we have just like a new opportunity, a new challenge in our lives. And we want everything to look put together or we want to look put together and perfect during the process. And that is just not the way life is, you know, whatsoever. The other day, I don't know what, what I was thinking about, but as far as a plant, like a seed must grow roots and then it has to break through the soil before, you know, it can grow and bloom. And just thinking of that moment where it has to break through the soil, it's not an easy process. And I wish that we would get that, you know, that life isn't supposed to be easy. Our journey isn't supposed to be easy. But it's also beautiful because I think there are so many lessons to be learned in the valley, like I always say. And to acknowledge that and to embrace that is a lesson in itself. So I just absolutely love like that mirror image of, you know, that process of, you know, working out or whatever you're doing and life and how it reflects. And I've always thought that as far as being an artist, because art usually mirrors life. And I, I always say that we are the keepers of the stories of many generations. You know, we tell the past, we tell the present and even the future. And I have really enjoyed seeing that awakening of many people to really acknowledge what art does and why it's needed. I mean, it hasn't been a complete like 180. So <laughs> I'm hopeful, you know, that that's going to change because, you know, even with, you know, kids in the school system, art is always like the number one thing to be cut, um, you know. So I think that really acknowledging the importance of artistry and art expression, really the importance 
on humanity and our survival, you know, which I think a lot of indigenous people and cultures definitely acknowledge it. I think it's, you know, a Western viewpoint where it's kind of tossed to the side, you know, unfortunately. (laughs) They're very industrial, unfortunately. And whether you can quantify something into numbers, and if you can't quantify it into numbers, then I'm like, it has no value, apparently. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And that's really unfortunate. And I think, I think that that is a struggle for a lot of artists, just being in this industry, because uh, you want your art to lead. But, you know, there's a lot of politics that's involved. Um, You know, it's a consumer's market basically, how do you live within that space? How do you navigate that space being an artist? Because I, and I separate artists from people who are just celebrities. I think, well, I know that there is a huge difference. There are many celebrities who are artists, but all celebrities are not artists. So how do you live within, you know, the the consumerism and, you know, the political aspect of this industry, but wanting the art to, the art to lead and the art to speak for itself, but you still got to like, you know, play the game? Yes. Okay, great question. Um, I guess it's a bit of taking that, leap of faith and being okay with, you know, when you first leap in, okay, maybe there's only three feet of water, you know, it's only a few people who are really um, vibing with me or understanding who I am as an artist or appreciating, I should even say, um, my artistry. And then just keep going and keep going until, you know, one day you look up and that pool is full and it's like okay I have this whole tribe and group of people who now support me and maybe it's not you know the hugest ocean or you know a large lake um, but being seeing the value and having gratitude in that group that does support you because you know it could be no one. <laughs> it could be no one but there is always someone <laughs> and even if there is no one who's supporting you um, you're still there and you're still valuable as if you found value in that art. We're all connected as human beings. There's somewhere, somewhere, so someone somewhere in the world, <laughs> words, that is going to feel it. They might not feel the same thing that you feel, but they're gonna get something out of it. And that's valuable. Even if they might say, ah, I didn't like it. They still received something out of it. Um, which I think that's something to appreciate. How big is community to you? How important is it? It's extremely important. Um, Your community is who supports you. It's what gives you that little bit of, you know, if you're not feeling so great, you're leaning back. They kind of give you that like, okay, you need to lift up, stand straight, speak loud, have that confidence. They allow you to be your best self. Um, your community is is very important. Um, And it's hard. I mean, I can understand um, if you don't feel you have that support in that community, but uh, when you do have that community or just acknowledge the community that you do have, um, it can be really beneficial to you as an artist, or I should say myself as an artist. Yeah. (laughs) What are your... What are your hopes or dreams or your, even your vision for artists, you know, in general, um, in the future? You know, what do you what, what would you like to see happen in this world as you know, when it comes to artistry and how it's expressed and accepted? I do see since the pandemic and just not even necessarily since the pandemic, just in general, the world is starting to include more artists and more artistry into things, even in terms of uh, commercials. Uh, You know, I see commercials for a a 
back pain ad and now there's like a guy dancing and I'm like that's so amazing where in the past you know uh it would have just been like two seconds of somebody being like oh <laughs> you know like so I love seeing um that art is becoming more of our everyday lives um in terms of you know when you I'm still in the city so when I get on the train I see that they have you know the poems and um, little things like that really make a difference throughout, uh, at least my day. So I'm assuming they make a difference throughout everyone else's day <laughs> as well, those little pockets of artistry. Um, but since the pandemic, I really love how everything becoming a little bit more virtual or most things having a virtual platform has allowed more artists to have a voice and to speak up and to showcase their talent. Um, not saying that, you know, the big heads or the, I don't want to call them the gatekeepers, but the, you know, the established artist companies, not saying that there's nothing wrong with them, but it's nice to see that, oh, okay, all these people have all these talents or um, they perhaps just are showcasing their talent in a different way or you're seeing who they are as opposed to who they've been portraying or working for. Um, so I love to see that all of these artists have kind of, I guess, emerged. We've been talking about the plants. They've, they've come out of the soil and uh, they all have this platform that they can create their own community or create their own tribes, which I think has been really great for um, the artist community. Yeah, I've definitely been loving seeing the evolution of so many different people. What do you say to that artist who's struggling to find their voice? They want to create and, you know, they want to have an impact, but they haven't really found the strength in their voice yet. What do you say to them? I say, like... You just have to go for it. You know, you have to jump um, and do it at your own pace. You know, uh, if you're a singer and, you know, you're, you want to sing, but, you know, maybe you're terrified of singing, sing to your friends or sing to people who you trust and you honor. And then as you build that confidence or you, uh, I guess with that, that's putting in the work. You have to put in the work into your trade, into your craft. Um, and the more work you put in the, you know, you keep doing those little, little steps, they're going to build up and build up until you build that confidence. You build that rapport that, uh, okay, you don't even have to think about this scene or this monologue. Like you've said it so many times, you've rehearsed it. It's just going to come out naturally and it's going to be perfect in you. Um, so, uh, I say to those artists, you know, make sure you're doing your homework. You have to do the work um, and then slowly, gradually build to be where you want to be. It's it's OK to start small and then, you know, allow yourself to have that gradual rise. Um, it's hard to just, you know, <laughs> go amateur night at the Apollo your first time. <laughs> right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> But you have to jump. You have to go out there and, you know, and realize that it's not going to be perfection. You know, <laughs> when you were talking, I just randomly start thinking about when you start talking about the monologues, <laughs> because there was a time I think this was in this was in college. Yeah, I think this only happened. one. It, well, it happened multiple times, but it was only one production. I knew this monologue like the back of my hand, but Every night before it was my cue, all of a sudden my mind went blank and like I'm on the stage, but somebody else is speaking and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I don't know my monologue. I don't know my monologue. And as soon as I heard my cue, I jumped up and recited the monologue. But that was so terrifying. And it happened more than once. <laughs> I was like, what? in the world <laughs> so yeah just you know go ahead and jump and remember 
that you are going to have many moments of jumping, you know, because I sometimes we forget that there's many more steps to take. You know, we have a lot of life to live if we're so fortunate. So never, never take for granted that moment of jumping and and flying. I was interviewing somebody else and she kept saying free falling. And I think that's just so beautiful to really surrender and allow ourselves to just be in the moment, especially as artists. I think that's one of the biggest lessons we can learn as artists is to live in the moment. Yasmin, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Who, how can people get in touch with you? Um, I know that you, you know, do, are you doing private um, a lot of lessons, like virtual? I'm doing private virtuals um, and I'm, I don't know if you want to see it. It looks a little crazy right now. I'm transforming. Um, I do live at home and I'm transforming. We had an extra room. So it's slowly becoming my uh, new workspace so that I am more official digital with my classes. And then I can have small in-person groups or in-person privates and things like that as well, which I'm looking forward to. Yes. Oh, I'm happy. I'm excited to see the space. Yeah. Yeah. So how can people um, get in contact and take a class with you? Yes. Um, so um, you can follow me on Instagram at not normal Yazzy, or I should say not normal underscore Yazzy. Um, and there it has my link to my talent hack. Um, or you can go to talenthack.com backslash. Uh, I think it's just my name, Yasmin Dot Venable. Um, and you can find it through there. Um, I have group classes, uh, group virtual classes. Um, anything from Pilates to a dance cardio to I have an open class where we literally do anything. It can, <laughs> some days we're doing handstands, some days we're <laughs> walking, some days. Um, so I have a, a, for a large range of classes, um, which can be kind of fun. Um, That's awesome. Yes, I love the variety. I will make sure to leave all of your contact information in the show notes. She's an amazing, amazing Pilates instructor. And I just overall love your spirit, Yasmin. I've always admired your spirit. You're just such a gentle soul and so welcoming. And I think it's that's so amazing to have, especially in the fitness space, because it's a very vulnerable space. And to have that gift to be able to welcome someone in, um, it just feels so accepting. So yeah, guys, take a class from her. She's amazing. (laughs) All right, Yasmin, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Guys, remember to jump. We are in a new year officially. I know life has been crazy, especially the life of an artist, but learning to pivot is a beautiful thing. So thank you so much for tuning in today. Remember that your testimony is not for yourself. It is for the world. Until next time, peace, love, and light.